Okay, so now we come uh, to a second item of this uh, plenary, building a just post-COVID-19 world. I will not read to you the rationale of it because it's almost outdated. When I, uh, when I wrote uh, this, uh, uh, the rationale, uh, I was optimist of something come post-COVID-19 world. We saw the war, uh, the unjust war uh, against uh, Ukraine and, uh, and other uh, amazing uh, atrocities we see all ar around the world. So let's put, put it as a question mark whether the post-COVID-19 world will be just or not. So I am so honored uh, today that we have uh, amazing four uh, speakers so uh, I will start by calling uh, uh, Afi Adugam uh, uh, to come to uh, uh, here to podium. Uh, he is a Maxwell Upson Professor of uh, Religion and Society at Princeton Theological Seminary and Professor Extraordinary at the University of uh, Selenbosch in South Africa. He is the current president of the ISA Research Committee uh, uh, 22, Sociology of Religion, and he, uh, his most recent book publication, uh, Indigeneity in African Religions, Oza Worldviews, Cosmopologies, and Religious Culture. Please join me in welcoming him for, for his talk, The Global Politicization and Regionalization of COVID-19 Pandemic the future of the past uh, uh, or the past of the future. Okay, so good afternoon. And uh, let me start with two footnotes. Uh, the first footnote is to thank Sorry for inviting me to this very special uh, panel. Uh, I will tell you I don't take this for granted. Uh, the second footnote is just a word of thanks and appreciation on behalf of ROC 22, Sociology of Religion, uh, for which I had been uh, president for in the past five years. And uh, we were so excited about uh, this conference because for many years, religion found its way on the title of the conference. So thank you for making sure that religion uh, came into uh, focus. Okay, so uh, I would like to share with you today what I have termed the global politicization and religionization of COVID-19 pandemic, the future of the past or the past of the future. A question mark. How do I move the slides here? Yeah. Okay. You want the kick? This one? No, no, you can take that. Okay. okay. Yes, see the green one. Okay. All right, so what I would like to do very quickly is to take you through my presentation roadmap and then uh, take it from there. Uh, first, I would like to provide a kind of a historical backdrop. Uh, attempt to historicize uh, pandemics uh, because uh, learning from history can be important for sociologists of, of religion. Uh, if I have time, uh, I will try to problem problematize the interconnectedness uh, between religion, science, and pandemics, uh, but also that helps to demonstrate uh, the ambivalence of religion, but as well as uh, the ambivalence of the connection between religion and, and pandemics. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, reflect on uh, a just concluded fieldwork uh, which took place uh, during the pandemic and what methodological implication this has for, for uh, sociology of religion. So my point of de uh, departure, therefore, would be uh, the decolonizing sociology of religion perspective, or if you like, uh, a decolonial tone 
to the sociology of religion. And uh, I find uh, Jean Spickard's uh, book, Alternative Sociology of Religion, uh, very illustrative uh, because uh, I see this book as a compelling case for adopting a global perspective in the sociology of religion. And uh, one aspect of uh, Spickard's book, uh, the, the whole idea of reflexive ethnography, uh, which points to uh, studying uh, religion as it, it is lived in everyday life. And I think this is very important, uh, especially against the backdrop of the colonizing sociology of religion uh, 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 project. Uh, also close uh, and akin to this is uh, Amaman's uh, uh, work studying uh, live religion, context and, and, and practices. And uh, so these two books uh, kind of point to the possibility of, of paying attention to uh, social, cultural, and uh, intellectual reflexivity, what uh, uh, Jim Spickard has called uh, ethnographic reflexivity. Uh, a second point that is important in this regard might be to uh, think more about uh, uh, the research as social location. And so it, it decolonizing sociology of religion uh, helps me particularly uh, to think more seriously about, on the one hand, uh, social loc uh, lo locationality, but also my po positionality as I conduct my research, both in Africa and uh, uh, in the diaspora. So having talked about my points of landing, uh, sorry, uh, points of departure, let me talk about my points of landing because I might never get to the conclusion of my work. So uh, I begin by providing some, making some sense uh, here. And I think that the colonizing uh, sociology of religion uh, provides a template for us to revisit sociological constructs, but sometimes also theor theoretical uh, assumptions. And very uh, uh, key in this, especially for me as a scholar, uh, is the sociological imagination. And I'm constantly asking myself this very important question what the sociology of religion would look like had it arisen in non-Western societies. But I think that question is also akin to the kind of debates we have today, uh, whether about secularization or secularism and so on and so forth. So in this regard, therefore, I keep asking myself, if Karl Marx or Max Weber or Emil Donkheim, uh, ancestors of sociology of religion, if they were contemporary sociologists of religion in Africa, what would they be theorizing about? And I think this important question helps me to make sense of how I conduct my research, but also how I attempt to theorize uh, and uh, analyze uh, based on the kind of data that I have. And therefore, uh, for instance, uh, the whole debate around secularizing trends and secularism uh, would be uh, an indicator, for instance, uh, in a way that we need to, particularly looking at other contexts like Africa, uh, how and to what extent might we think that this, these paradigms are, are universal or are universal trends. And we could even single out the, the very notion of a secular nation there are iterations of the notion of a secular nation. And, and I think uh, the colonizing sociology of religion helps me, part particularly in, in the context within which I do research, to say, what does a secular nation here mean? And what does it mean in a context like the US? And I think uh, these discourses are very uh, complex. Another aspect that I pay attention to uh, using the decolonizing uh, uh, sociology of religion uh, project, uh, there's a tendency within uh, uh, traditional sociology to uh, dichotomize you know, sacred and mundane domains you know, uh, as if these are mutually uh, exclusive. And I think in the context within which I do my research, there's uh, a vivid you know, fluidity uh, in a way in which uh, sacred and non-sacred or secular uh, 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 domains are not mutually exclusive. Uh, 
And I think that is important to, to bring to the fore, especially in our consideration. Uh, uh, another example, perhaps, the debate around enchantment and disenchantment and re-enchantment of the world. And I ask myself, how does all these binaries make sense in the context of Africa? Uh, has there been disenchantment in order for me to begin to think about re-enchantment? And I think uh, uh, these are very important, but also the question about religion and, and spirituality. How, how do these terminologies make sense within the context in which I research? And finally, I think there's a, uh, very importantly, uh, perhaps we need uh, uh, doing research in, in Africa uh, to prioritize local epistemologies, uh, cosmologies, and the narratives of uh, uh, you Quitodian know, life and experiences. And against this backdrop, uh, uh, this helps me uh, to have an inroad to the kind of research uh, that I have carried out in the past uh, uh, recent years, particularly during the COVID uh, period. So let me do a very quick historical backdrop again. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, this is not new. Very few phenomena throughout human history have shaped our societies and cultures the way outbreaks of infectious diseases have. And one of the greatest catastrophes ever, if not the greatest one, in the entire history of mankind uh, was uh, an outbreak of a pandemic. In a long succession throughout history, pandemic outbreaks have de uh, decimated societies, uh, determined outcomes of wars, but also sometimes uh, wiped out entire uh, populations. But also paradoxically, uh, it's not simply about the downside uh, on the one hand, of course, we can ask the question, what is the pandemic good for? Is it good for anything? I would say that to a large extent, uh, such crises, you know, also clears the way for innovation and advances in science, including medicine and public health, economy, political systems, but also uh, in, in my present conversation, religious innovation and creativity. For instance, uh, taking this historical backdrop, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic gave rise to several African indigenous churches and prophetic figures as colonial hospitals and mission churches were in quandary about how to respond to or combat the uh, influenza virus. So looking at the pandemic from a rear view uh, mirror, uh, if we take the case of the Spanish uh, uh, influenza epidemic of uh, the 1918, uh, 1919, uh, arguably it's uh, the worst pandemic in human history, but well, I, I'm, I, I don't know, I think that is contestable too, which killed some 50 million people worldwide, some three to, uh, to four percent of the world's population in 18 months. Of all six continents, Africa, and particularly sub-Saharan Africa, suffered the highest average mortality rate in the pandemic. The 1918 flu pandemic killed approximately 2.4 million Africans, which represents 1.8% of the continent's population. So this brings me to uh, my uh, first point. Uh, in terms of Christian responses, what I've simply alluded to right now about uh, the pandemic of 1918, the Spanish pandemic, uh, led to the rise of you know, a number of uh, you know, African independent churches. And uh, the co coincidence of the uh, devastating pandemic and the climax of the terrible war, world war was more than just chance and in fact, uh, interpreted this as a sign that deeper things were afoot. So in 1918 uh, to 1921, amidst this, you know, psychological, uh, physical, emotional, and spiritual travail, several charismatic prophets rose up in sub-Saharan Africa, preaching millenarism, faith healing, and the need for instant uh, repentance and, and renewal. For instance, in Nigeria, 
in the Belgian Congo, in Southern Rhodesia, which became Zimbabwe, and South Africa, among others. A number of independent praying churches were founded in these years to take forward the visions of these prophets. So my point here is that in triggering their creation, the Spanish flu pandemic thus contributed to the emergence of independent African churches. So what does this mean? I'm therefore suggesting that perhaps looking at the, the connection between, or the ambivalent connection between religion and, uh, and pandemics, I think one might uh, be safe to suggest that uh, on the one hand, uh, religious beliefs or praxis can result in disaster, in chaos, in crisis, and so on and so forth. If we flip the coin, one might think that pandemics can also result, uh, taking the example I've given, in the emergence of new religious movements. You know, so in other words, new religious movements uh, could be a direct product of pandemics or epidemics or crisis or disaster. And this, this ambivalent character uh, for me uh, is very important. So perhaps sociologists of religion might need to offer new theoretical and methodological perspectives for grasping this uh, correlation. So that's my first point. Now uh, I'm going to use the specific case of Africa just to, to make sense of this. How am I doing? Oh, okay. So uh, if looking at uh, the pandemic uh, in, in Africa, projection models were developed for Africa with the assumption that uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2 would be an exponential pattern of transmission. And the people thought, oh God, Africa will be wipe, wiped off completely. And this makes sense because, I mean, if you think about crowded social life and the poor uh, health facilities and so on and so forth, it makes sense to think that way. But Gross, uh, Bernstein, and Mesha uh, uh, calls our attention to what they call the African paradox uh, he is suggesting that the impact, both infection and death rates, caught mostly on suspecting public by, uh, by root shock and surprise, as the case fatality remained remar remarkably uh, low up to date. And I, what I was very interested in is the backlash of public discourses that these this projections and this thinking uh, uh, brought about. So uh, here I just wanted to show uh, broader statistics of uh, total reported, you know, debt, 6.3 million uh, globally, uh, and uh, the total confirmed uh, cases uh, as at, uh, yes. Uh, and, and then here you see the countries that, that were most hit in terms of uh, the debt rates. And uh, you see, again, uh, comparing continents, uh, you could see Africa was almost flat, you know, uh, in this regard, and uh, we can go on and on uh, and see both uh, mapping in the, the terms of uh, the infection rates, but also the global vaccine uh, rollout, rollout. And here, uh, I'm going to talk about the politicization, politicization of, uh, of uh, uh, COVID a little bit. So because of my time, um, I wanted to just share some of the backlash, you know, uh, regarding both these projections thinking that Africa will be wiped off because of a number of cases. Uh, for instance, uh, there were uh, several iterations of, of hypotheses, either climate, genetic evolution by natural selection, trained immunity, age factor. So there were a multiplicity of, of factors uh, that were uh, put forward to, to explain uh, why uh, the, the, we re reckon low COVID-19 related uh, mortality uh, in Africa. But I think for me, it's important uh, for sociologists to make sense of the agency, question of agency. How did Africans, you know, make sense of the pandemic? How did they respond? How did they attempt to combat, you know, the pandemic against the backdrop of global politics? And so uh, this also points to all kinds of emerging discourses. Uh, for instance, 
uh, uh, the first would be the critique of uh, perceived secularization trends. So it's a bit of a non-academic contribution to, to uh, uh, the debate on, on secularization, when in many cases, some Africans uh, argue that you know, the pandemic was God's punishment of the Western world for becoming too secularized. And you hear that uh, uh, through the media, you hear that from uh, religious spaces. Uh, others suggest that uh, what one might call the narratives of immunity, that at the earliest stages, that Africans were immune to the virus, you know, because it's of sunshine as well, but also because of the body makeup, you know, and things like that. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, 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 conspiracy theories and denia, denia, deniers, you know. But uh, what is also interesting uh, is the politicization and the spiritual, spiritualization of the, uh, of the pandemic, which uh, can be teased out, especially uh, looking at the global inequalities, uh, insecurity, but also hypocrisy. And that is partly understood, especially uh, thinking about the disproportionate provision and access to, to vaccines. And that partly led to the commodification of vaccines. So we think about the economics of, of vaccines when uh, vaccines were produced in certain contexts and they say, well, we, we don't care what happens in other contexts, let's deal with our people first. You know, and then once we are done with our people, then we can give the remnants of the vaccine, uh, which is a bit a crazy idea. So the f another important point uh, in terms of the agency, therefore, uh, which our uh, research has paid attention to is the indigenous agency, creativity, uh, initiatives, responses, uh, how Africans in many contexts decided to take their destiny in their hands as the vaccine was slow in coming. For instance, many uh, uh, turned to local uh, preventive and, and treatment remedies, the use of garlic and lemongrass and bitter cola, uh, they became scarce in many African societies because people decided to, take, to respond to this in their own way. Um, half on? One minute, okay. So what I've tried to do uh, here is just to show uh, the kind of uh, debates that, that generated, you know, following the pandemic itself, uh, but also how those debates uh, uh, were very political in nature in many respects, but how also uh, those debates uh, were, debates around uh, COVID-19 were also spiritualized. You know, where some talked about, uh, of course, talking about how uh, this was a punishment from God, which of course became also a global discourse. Uh, but those, those debates were important uh, for us to understand how Africans, uh, but also particularly religious communities, uh, both responded, uh, tried to make sense of it, but also how to combat uh, 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 the, the virus. Uh, the second part of my paper, which I had no time to get into, is how the research we we, we won a bid uh, from Tempington uh, to, to conduct a research uh, on uh, modernization mega churches uh, uh, in the global south. And uh, when we applied for this project, we, we didn't uh, think about COVID. But when we got the grant, COVID struck. And because of that, we could not, uh, we could not uh, conduct our research, but had to revisit our methodologies in a way and also our research questions to, to interrogate how these mega churches were responding to, to, to COVID. So let me stop there because of my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Afi, and uh, really uh, uh, you raise uh, interesting uh, points about scholarization and, uh, and regionalization uh, of uh, pandemic um, in 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 the presidential plenary uh, i invited two philosophers and two sociologists in the beginning so uh, to give a message that we need to be connected to philosophy and specifically to moral philosophy and uh, today 
uh, I invited an anthropologist to keep the ties with uh, all uh, disciplines in social science and particularly um, uh, anthropology. So uh, uh, I'm honored to have with us today uh, Didier Fassin. Uh, he's a French anthropologist and sociologist. He's a James Wolfenson Professor of, so of Social Science in the Institute of the Advanced Studies in Princeton and hold a direction of studies in political and moral anthropology at the Ecole des Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. In he has been appointed to the chair of public health at the Collège de France, and uh, he was elected also to the American Philosophy Society in 2022. So uh, uh, he, uh, his talk is about unlearned lessons of the pandemic. Didier, are you with us? I am. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. I know uh, we woke you up. Sorry for that. Early in Paris. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Sari, for uh, your invitation and Isa as well. Uh, it's, it is a great honor for me to uh, be participating in this concluding session. And I only regret uh, not to be physically present uh, with you. So as the pandemic is slowly drifting away, no more lockdown, no more vaccine requirements, no more masks in public transportation, no more tests necessary to travel, no more controversy on pseudo treatments, no more conspiracy theory on digital microchip implants, we might tend to turn the page, forget these painful moments, and unlearn the lessons of what has been a unique crisis, not only in the modern history of public health, but also in the contemporary history of global governance. When I say that the pandemic is slowly drifting away, I do not want to minimize the burden of long COVID, which is still experienced by numerous patients, maybe some in this room, the everlasting enigma of the origin of the pandemic, which has new, new twists almost every month, and the work of researchers and institutions who try to understand what have been the, epidemiologic, the epidemiological dynamic of the disease to determine what have been the most effective measures undertaken and to study new drugs for future outbreaks. But human beings are prompt to efface the past, especially in a context of time acceleration and fact erasure. To imagine the future, as the organizer are inviting the panelists to do in uh, this last session of the conference, one must value the remembrance of things past. I just used the word crisis, which I'm sure no one would deny. However, when we say that the pandemic has produced an unprecedented crisis, we do not mean that the disease itself is the worst we have experienced in the modern era. What we mean is that the response to the pandemic, that is the lockdown implemented across continents with stay-at-home orders, the interruption of economic and pedagogic activities, the massive financial input of states, the turn to online teaching and work, the closure of national borders, the expedited search for vaccines, the imposition of new norms of living, has no known precedent on such a scale. Rather than merely epidemiological, the crisis has been one of governance. Its modalities have been multiple, authoritarian in China, limited in South Korea, drastic in Australia, contradictory in Britain, accommodating in Germany, quasi-absent in Sweden, belated and rigorous in Italy, inconsistent and heterogeneous in the United States, paternalistic and repressive in France. Beyond these differences in style of governance, however, government have decided to discontinue, at least to some degree, and for some time, most businesses, schools, public events, normal life, the strictest measures being taken in countries most unprepared and most unreactive. The pandemic has indeed revealed how uh, an event announced 
had yet not been anticipated. Unpreparedness and unreactiveness have been the signatures of the crisis of governance. They were, at least in part, the consequences of the excesses of neoliberalism and capitalism. France is a case in point. On the one hand, neoliberal policies of the past decades had caused a large decrease in public services, which affected in particular the number of beds and health professionals in hospitals, and was the first reason for the extreme measures adopted to compensate this short, these shortages. On the other hand, capitalist strategies have developed outsourcing of the production of basic goods, which generated a lack of drugs such as acetaminophen and anesthetics, and a dependence on countries with cheaper labor. As a result, measures adopted by the government were harsher. In France, which at the beginning of the pandemic had neither masks nor tests, where first-line and second-line workers had no protection, where cases were not strictly isolated and contact persons were not looked for, a general lockdown was rigidly implemented with severe sanctions in case of violation. As in many other countries, sanitary policing substituting for lacking public health policy. There were two major consequences of this policy. First, a partial suspension of public liberties and basic rights, freedom of movement, of meeting, of protesting, sometimes of expression, right to education, work, private life, asylum protection, intimacy with one loved ones uh, for the end of life, and propriety rules in the honoring of the dead. With time, these extreme measures declined. Secondly, a temporary interruption of the economy with predictable de deleterious effects, recession, increase in the public debt, bankruptcy of uh, companies, expansion of unemployment and under underemployment, discontinuation of healthcare insurances and social protection for some, popularization of the already most vulnerable categories with food insecurities. Bailouts and injection of public money into social programs have somewhat reduced these effects. Yet, these are considerable sacrifices for a nation. They had only one raison d'etre, the reduction of the mortality due to the coronavirus. In other words, this was deemed the price to pay to save lives which were mostly the lives of elderly people since at the beginning of the pandemic in rich countries, four deaths out of five occurred after 65 and three out of five after 75 at the time when COVID represented less than 10% of the causes of death. The COVID moment is thus the culmination of a historic trend that has given an increasing value to life, that has even made life our highest good. This trend has been epitomized in the past half century with the rise of a global humanitarian governmentality. This is certainly a rupture with previous periods when lives could be sacrificed, especially on battlefields. Think of World War I and its 19 million casualties, half of them soldiers, the other half civilians. But this rupture in the valuing of life is certainly not evenly distributed and the death of enemies do not fall under the same principle. We may have in mind Madeleine Albright's infamous comment in 1996 that the estimated 500,000 deaths of Iraqi children were worth punishing Saddam Hussein. As is well known, Michel Foucault showed that Western modernity is characterized by the advent of what he called biopower, the power of a life, which replaced the early, earlier sovereignty with its power to kill. Biopower, on the contrary, is the power to exercise control over bodies and population via multiple institutions and technology. Probably for chronological reasons, because the movement was only emerging in the 1970s when he was proposing this compelling argument, his theory misses another dimension that is even more characteristic of contemporary societies and can be called biolegitimacy. It is the recognition of life as the highest good, 
but life in singular, life in abstracto, because lives in plural, lives in concreto, obey different rules. The global response to the pandemic can therefore be regarded as the advent of biolegitimacy. But what does saving lives mean? Which lives and whose lives? Certainly, form of, of li forms of life are given less salience and certain lives less worthiness than others. To the first question, which lives? The answer is straightforward. It is the f to the physical life that government refer when they justify their measures. It is what Walter Benjamin calls the simple fact of being alive, which human beings have in common with animals and even plants. But is it the only possible form of life? What about the social life, the relationship uh, with one's family and friends, their self-realization through work, art, children, pleasure, in a nutshell, everything that, that gives a meaning to the fact of being alive, everything that dis distinguishes human life from the life of animals and plants. For instance, in intensive care units or nursing homes, was the risk of contamination by the coronavirus sufficient to deprive people from the presence of their dear ones as they are laid dying, and after their death, from being honored for what their life had been. Said otherwise, how do we balance mortality and dignity, being alive and having a good life, including a good end of life? By merely emphasizing life as biology, the response to the pandemic has uncovered that there was another aspect, neglected, which is life as biography, life as the sum of events that can be recounted, to quote Anna Arendt. To the second question, whose lives? The answer is again manifest. Not all lives have received the same attention from governments. Those who had to keep working were all the more exposed that, at least in, at the beginning of the, the crisis, they did not have the protective equipment. Health personnel, medical transporters, and mortuary workers definitely, but also those involved in food delivery, retail sale, correction, correctional institution, home aid, sanitation, construction, etc., through their interaction with people during work as well as during transportation to their workplace. A majority of those workers who could not, could not maintain their activity remotely belong to the disadvantaged segment of society and contrary to physicians and nurses who were celebrated as heroes, they remained largely unseen. And not only were they exposed to the risk of being infected, but in a country like the United States, where the healthcare system is so socially differentiated, studies have shown that they were also less likely to get tested, hospitalized, and treated in the most favorable way. Besides, due to overcrowding of their housing, more frequent pre-existing conditions, and significant overweight due to inadequate health behavior, their risk of developing a severe form of COVID was substantially increased. Studies estimate that African Americans were twice as often hospitalized than whites, and that their risk of dying was tripled. How much value did their lives had then? How much less than those of the wealthy who could afford the best care? How much will the pandemic add to the current gap of 15 years in life expectancy at birth between whites with a university degree and blacks high school dropouts? Although less studied, France has similar social disparity in mortality and life expectancy. <clears throat> this inequality corresponds to what John uh, Galtung calls structural violence, which is the unequal weight of, social, of society on bodies. To expand the two questions, which lives, whose lives, I will focus on two points which I have specially studied. First, the situation of prisoners and exiles, and second, the prospect for the aftermath of the health crisis. So prisons <clears throat> offer a, parado a paradox. There, confinement is the rule, but it is not protective. 
Whereas the general population is supposed to benefit from the lockdown by being less in contact with the virus, inmates who are locked up have an increasing risk as a result of their forced confinement. This is certainly the case for in short-term facilities. In the United States, most governors did not dare to free prisoners, even elderly, even with serious disease, diseases, from state correctional institution for fear of the reaction of their constituency. In the state of New Jersey, which I know best, three months after the beginning of the pandemic, the death rate by COVID of 16 per 10,000 inmates was by far the highest in the country, a situation to be paralleled with the fact that the state has also the largest overrepresentation of black people in prison, neither of those elements having had a significant impact on the re release of at-risk inmates. In France, on the contrary, the prison population was, was reduced by almost 20% as a result of two combined factors, the judi judicial system being almost shut down a few prison sentences were given, and after the issuance of an order by the Ministry of Justice, inmates less than three months from the end of their sentence benefited from an early release, generally with a, an electronic bracelet. Besides, various measures were taken to prevent dissemination of the virus. In the first three months of the pandemic, there had been 510 deaths due to COVID among inmates of state and federal prison in the United States and only one in the French correction system. In proportion to the prison population in the two countries, there were thus 25 times more death by the coronavirus in the United States than in France. If the sociologist Maurice Alvax was right when he wrote more than a century ago that, I quote, there, were, there, are, there are good reasons to think that a society has the mortality that suits it, and that the number of deaths and their distribution at different ages accurately expresses the importance that a society attaches to prolonging the life more or less, then we could infer that France grants 25 times more value to the life of its prisoners than the United States. However, if we consider life in a broader sense than merely being alive, we should wonder how is the social and moral life of prisoners, their dignity and their privacy, being respected in the correctional facilities in both countries? To realize the lot of frustrations, humiliations, violence they endure far beyond the sheer, the sheer privation of their liberty. There's another population that is forcibly confined. These people have not committed any crime. In fact, some of them have even been victims of criminals. They are undocumented migrants and asylum seekers. In both the United States and France, many of them are in custody in centers often resembling intern internment camps with poor sanitation conditions and under a quasi-suspension of their rights. In France, the state refused to close detention centers, which had become useless since it was impossible to deport the detained as borders were closed and international flights were canceled. Driven to extreme distress due to both the fear of the virus and the prospect of their expulsion, some attempted to their lives in a desperate gesture that did not even elicit compassion among their guards, while others organized protests with the support of activists outside and began hunger strikes with very little echo in the media. It is notable that migrants and refugees were treated with less humanity than prisoners, thus revealing their position at the lowest level of current moral hierarchies. The necropolitics of forced exile, to use Achille Bembe's word, with at least 57,000 deaths in the process of migration in less than 10 years is an undoubtable symptom of the global indifference toward these migrants and refugees. Until now, I've limited my scope to the protection of lives immediately related to the pandemic. But what about the consequences of the response to the pandemic? And not only the response, but the response to the response. I mean the austerity measures 
with reduction of public services and public jobs now implemented to compensate the increase in expenses during the pandemic. This is, of course, uncertain and unstable territory as we try to imagine the future. Two sorts of lives or meanings of life are at stake, the missing ones and the injured ones. The former correspond to the physical form of life, the latter to its social form. Both very much depends on how much of a welfare state a society has, how much solidarity is inscribed in its history. The predictable social repercussion of the response in terms of missing lives can be extrapolated from various economic crises that, uh, that they have a high cost in terms of mortality. Thus, in the United States, following the 2008-2009 crisis, there has been an increase of 6% in age-adjusted mortality rate among mid-age adults, corresponding to more than 33,000 deaths in excess, only between the ages of 25 and 64. This evolution has caused for the first time in the past half century an inversion of the curve of life expectancy, which is now declining in the United States. Suicides, alcohol-related diseases, overdoses with the opioid, but also cardiovascular diseases are the leading causes in a context of high unemployment and psychological distress. Didier, yeah. a recent can, book, can you conclude? Yeah. 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 In a recent book, Anne Case and Angus Deaton speak of death of despair. These missing lives will not make the headlines. They will not count, be counted and announced on an everyday basis as, are, uh, as were the ones uh, to the coronavirus. They will not be emotionally presented on television with stories and tears. They will remain ignored for the most part, except perhaps within academic circles, when in 2030 or 2035, th statistics will show the increase in mortality across age categories. However, life is not just about not being dead. When considering the consequences of the health crisis, it is crucial to take into account the injured lives of those who are still alive, but whose worth seems to have declined. The loss of one's job, the eviction from one's home, the devaluation of one's independence via the fall into assistance program, the disgrace of exposing one's failures to uh, one's children and partner, all these intimate tra tragedies cause deep damages in many lives, especially among the most vulnerable segments of society, among the low-income families, among minorities, Black and Hispanics in the United States, Blacks and Arabs in France who suffer the most. In his okay. theory of recognition, Ax Axelonet speaks of moral injuries, which correspond to situations in which the relations with others is affected, harming the three dimensions that allow the self-realization of everyone, self-confidence, self-respect, self-esteem. In other words, what makes a person looks back at his or her life and say, it was worth living it. These injured lives are even more ignored than the missing ones. So just a last word. My focus has been so far on rich countries, especially the two I've been working on in recent years. But on a global scale, the consequences of the governance of the pandemic are even more preoccupying. According to the World Bank, while half the population of the planet lives in poverty, the crisis has generated the biggest setback in decades with 70 million more people in extreme poverty an increase of almost 10%. Contrary to the expectations and hopes of progress of recovery after the COVID shock, both now climate change and the war between the two world's largest wheat producers have made things even worse. But these phenomena are not the only factors responsible for this disastrous situation. It is the structural conditions both in international relations and in national distribution of resources that are at stake. Inequality between and within countries is thus the major challenge to a post-COVID 
just world. Only the reclaim of public goods, the promotion of solidarity, and the defense of all lives and all forms of life can reduce the destructive impact of unjust policies and politics of injustice worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Didier Fassin. I think we will come back to the discussion. Uh, I'm honored now uh, to have Eva Ulouz. Uh, she is uh, a Director of Study at L'Ecole des Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris, a member of the Center of Rationality at Hebrew University, and hold uh, the uh, uh, Rose uh, Isaac Chair in Sociology there. Uh, she is a past president of uh, Betselel Academy of Arts. Uh, Ilouz has uh, 14 books about diverse topics on love, culture, capitalism, crystallization of the psychological culture, uh, industry of happiness, the impact on modernity, uh, of modernity on emotions, etc. Her book has been numerous international, uh, won numerous international awards and have been translated into 25 languages. Uh, Today, she will talk about fear, the anti-democratic emotion. Eva, good morning. Yes. S sorry Hello. to walk you up uh, early. I hope you, <laughs> you got your coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I, di I didn't yet. <laughs> so sorry, thank you so much uh, for this invitation. And um, actually, I'm so glad that I managed not to even to be uh, frustrated by the lack of caffeine in my body right now. So I'm not going to present a research paper in the strict sense of the word. Um, and my paper, by the way, is astonishingly resonant with uh, the one that Didier just uh, presented. Uh, but mine will be less, um, I, would, I would say, less a research paper. I'm just going to present some musings I had, which attempt to link together two key words of the conference and our panel, authoritarianism and the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it's really more an attempt to raise questions than to provide uh, uh, answer and research. I'd like to start with a piece of statistics, which I found very puzzling and which is the starting point for this paper. The use of the coronavirus pandemic observed the greatest gun sales in American history. Almost 20 million uh, guns were sold in 2020, the highest number ever, and another 18.5 million in 2021. Given that guns are not known to combat viruses, we can only conclude that these uh, actions correspond to a cultural logic which we need to elucidate and decipher. Consider another fact. It is roughly the same group of people which bought uh, weapons uh, en masse, which also opposed the vaccines. This is because weapon owners and anti vaxxers identify with the authoritarian and populist leaders like Donald Trump. And by the way, this is also the reason why people who identify with the GOP in America died in higher proportions than people who identified with Democrats during the pandemic. In other words, the political fracture which divides Democrats and Republicans was largely replicated during the pandemic and even took some very sharp turns. Now, there is no doubt that this political fracture had to do with the status of scientific knowledge, since the people who buy weapons are overwhelmingly Republicans and Trumpists, and since the GOP has taken on the mission of contesting the status of scientific claims and dismissing experts, degree holders, and the universities themselves. In fact, the out, being the outcome of expert knowledge and being recommended by experts, it was not surprising that the vaccine rather than the virus became the prime object of fears. The debate around vaccine became so violent Eva, you, 
you you mute, you muted yourself. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when when did I go? When did I um, when did I stop? Okay. So in fact, being the outcome. The of, last of only the last two sentences. Okay, so I'm just saying that, in fact, that the buyers of weapons are Republicans and Trumpists, and the GOP has taken on the mission of contesting the status of scientific claims, and that given that the vaccine had been recommended by experts and was uh, done by uh, through expert knowledge and was recommended by experts, it was not surprising that it was actually the object of fears of this group and um, and their opposition to the vaccine became very violent. So I think certainly the relationship to knowledge is an important one, but I think it's not the only one. I think we need to really understand the source of the fear and how the fear of the vaccine uh, is actually constructed. To understand why some feared the virus and why some did not, why some feared the vaccine and why some did not, we need to inquire into the various meanings this group attached to their fears. That is, we need to understand the meanings and the institutions behind those fears. So let me make a short detour about the role of fear in politics. Fear is crucial to the exercise of power. This is indeed how Machiavelli understood the power of the prince. The prince is the prince only in as much as he is feared, and in his hands, fear is a blunt tool to maintain social order through the fear of punishment. This view of fear as an effect and an instrument of political power changed with the 17th century Thomas Hobbes. In his vision, of um, uh, liberalism, um, fear was the first passion. It was the most fundamental one. And the containment of the fear became the basis for the new, uh, for the Leviathan, for the liberal state. Political philosopher Judith Schlar went one step further. In their theory, in her theory of liberalism, fear must be expunged from society altogether. This is how she defined liberalism. Every adult should be able to make as many effective decisions without fear. And that belief is the original and only defensible meaning of liberalism." End of quote. In other words, the capacity to expunge fear and cruelty from society became the main and perhaps only legitimating rationale behind liberalism. And yet insufficiently accounted by Sklar is a puzzling property of liberal regimes that has been explored by many sociologists. And it is that because the aim of liberal regimes is to secure the safety of their citizens, the ideals of safety and security have paradoxically generated the multiplication of public spheres. Sociologist Barry Glasner captured well the paradoxical nature of fear in contemporary societies when he claimed that many fears are constructed to protect against other fears and indeed against fear itself. And in fact, uh, you know, and a beautiful example is in the American uh, Declaration of Independence in which the state declares the obligation to protect the safety of the citizens. The 2020 pandemic was unique and exemplary of this kind of fear. Governments throughout the world made close to 5 billion people relinquish off and on their mobility, their work, and their ordinary socializing. As a researcher succinctly wrote at the time of the pandemic, the, corona fri uh, the coronavirus frightens all of humanity. That billions of people became confined made this pandemic truly a planetary event, the first of its kind, lived and shared as a common threat and disaster. Worldwide lockdowns, I think, are the true political novelty here. Moreover, the crisis was handled with a rare level of homogeneity through expert knowledge, continuous media coverage, social media and governmental policies, even though I'm aware, of course, of variations. I, the stunning immobility and the willing obedience to orders um, 
sometimes that we are completely upset. Uh, you are again, uh, again mute, okay? At first, just, I thought just this last was sentence. Yeah. I've, I've, at first, I thought this was a simple confirmation of the Hobbesian view that fear of death is the most powerful political passion and that we will always be willing to sacrifice freedom for security. But I think there is more. I think there is a profound change in the nature of the relationship of the state to the citizens, and Didier spoke about it before. I think there is something we may call a sanitary pact between the state and the citizens. In this sanitary pact, the state is entrusted with the responsibility to ensure not only the physical integrity of citizens, but also the health and longevity of life. And one landmark of this uh, might be found in the emergence of the World Health Organization in 1946, in which we can read that the parties of this constitution declare that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, etc. And then it says, the achievement of any state in the protection, in the promotion and protection of health is of value to all, end of quote. So, this is really, an, uh, I think, a new international charter which proposed nothing less than subsuming health under the broader and morally more fundamental category of human right, making health as fundamental, in fact, as freedom. This considerably extended the power and vocation of the state, which was now endowed with the mission of ensuring not only protection from enemies, but also a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. With the expansion of the pharmaceutical industries and its products to extend life with the increased authority of doctors, the state considerably extended its vocation to regulate life itself, the bios, exactly what Didier Fassin talked about before, through health. We can thus say that after World War II emerged many groups whose moral vocation to increase health physical performance and longevity could no longer be separated from their professional interest to do so. So the planetary policy of lockdowns and the planetary fear were, were expressions of this transformation of the pastoral role of the state, making longevity and health its, um, you know, one of its main objects. Um, and this derives from what philosopher François Eval has called the ascendancy of a precautionary sensibility, that is, thinking about risks and preempting them. And for François Eval, this is underwritten by a cultural mood, which assumes the uncertainty of causality between action and effect. This sensibility endows fear with a privileged status because it embeds it in the calculation of risk, in prudence, and in rationality. In this view, it is rational to feel fear. Moreover, given that political leaders are accountable, they must always entertain as a matter of cognitive routine the worst case scenario. So worst case scenarios, crisis, imagine flooded hospitals and the breakdown of the healthcare system itself which would presumably lead to the breakdown of society itself. So, so, so let me just call this fear the pastoral fear, which derives from the pastoral role, the pastoral care of the state. And let me now move to something else. Many scholars note the multiplication of fears in contemporary societies, None of them distinguishes different types of fear, most notably between pastoral fear, which I just mentioned, and another one, no less crucial, the fear of the outside enemy, bellicist fear. Contrary to Schlar's view, fear does not disappear in liberal societies because enmity never fades. Many have claimed, for example, that since the 911 attacks, the United States entered into a war against terrorism whose enemy was vague, shifting, and uncertain, and that, as a result, securitism took hold of American 
uh, psyche and governance. Securitism is a doctrine which puts the police and the military mode of thinking at the center of executive power and justifies bypassing many civil rights and freedoms. In the American context, nowhere is the connection between fear and securitism more visible than in the National Rifle Association. 150 years ago, the NRA was a sporting association dedicated to hunting and to the art of shooting. In the 1960s, when legislators decided to limit the use of guns, the backlash was powerful, and the NRA morphed into an organization dedicated to the legitimation of the use of arms. It did this in two ways. One was through their claim that we're honoring the Constitution and constitutional freedom. And the second was through the idea of self-defense, itself justified by fear of crime. A report published by the Center for American Progress, uh, Nonpartisan Institute, summarizes aptly the NRA strategy of the last decades. It says, the NRA masterfully constructed a narrative based on gun rights propaganda evoking images of a society devoid of rule of law and under constant threat of attack from an unidentified but ever-present enemy. According to Gallup research conducted in 2019, the top reason for owning a gun is personal protection. So the motive of self-protection and the motive of freedom of the libertarian variety have become closely and tightly intertwined. Not by chance where Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, George Bush and Donald Trump, all members of the NRA. The, while the NRA has been in the past a nonpartisan organization, it has become aligned with the right and even the extreme right. Let me now go back to the puzzle with which I started this paper about the purchase of weapons during the pandemic and the political lines of fractures around the vaccine. I'm going back to this. So I have described so far three kinds of fear. The fear from the prince to imprison me, wound me, or kill me. This fear affects everyone. The pastoral fear, which during the pandemic turned out to have been mainly espoused by social democrats, and moderate Republicans. And then the third fear, which I call the bellicist fear, that is the fear from an enemy which simultaneously builds in-group solidarity and hostility towards perceived enemies. The people who refuse to fear the virus, who fear the vaccine, are the same who are afraid of crime, who subscribe to a bellicist fear, and who are the most likely to subscribe to the political agenda of the extreme right. They bought weapons in unprecedented numbers because this is the main cultural schema for their fear, the bellicist fear. So I would argue that bellicist and pastoral fear activate different epistemology, one based on binary categories of friends and foe, and another one based on risk calculation and uncertainty. These epistemologies contain very different ways of organizing the social world. Bellicist fear commands to strike as the enemy. The fear of a virus is very different. It does not divide between enemies and friends. If anything, it reaches everyone indifferently and abolishes the distinction between friend and foe. It builds unexpected bonds of solidarity, for example, between the young and the old, or between nations, as when France and Germany did not use their vaccine as long as it had not reached smaller nations of Europe. Moreover, that kind of fear invited to immobility and to staying in-house in the female domestic sphere, the opposite of the male battlefield. Staying at home is viewed as passive, probably because it is dedicated to caring, while Bellicist fear is more comfortable with winning or killing. Thirdly, this was a kind of fear in which the only weapon, the pastoral fear, in which the only weapon was restraint and containment of one's body. When you wear a mask, when you're being confined at home, for example, and it does not enable the body to exert its full power in fighting or expressing rage or hate, for example. Four, Bellis's fear expects from the individual to fend for himself and not to seek protection from the state. 
The invocation of the Second Amendment by the NRA is underlined by a deeply libertarian, neoliberal right-wing sensibility. Weapons become the symbol of freedom, mistrust of government, and individual self-reliance. Government is corrupt and immoral, and the individual and freedom are moral, and the weapon belongs to this moral economy. More than that, in as much as precautionary fear, pastoral fear is the outcome of calculation and rationalization by experts, the danger they warn against appears to be more abstract than the tangible, immediate, imminent threat of the enemy of the battlefield. Because it is formulated by experts, it is suspected of being unreal, self-serving, and manipulated. Five. Eva, can, you, Eva yeah. can, you, can you conclude? Yeah. Because as time is over, can you conclude, please? Yeah. Uh, um, okay. So I guess, I guess uh, you see what uh, where I'm getting at. I, I'm not going to finish my analysis. A fascinating interpretation of the current move to populism has been made by William Davis. And the evidence collected in the United States and in Europe suggests that the people who are most drawn to Trump or Le Pen often have significantly lower life expectancy and health prospects than average. In other words, people who are most worried about their body are the ones most likely to endorse a militarized security view of society and the least likely to endorse a politics of pastoral fear. Uh, so, the, my second point for my conclusion is also that we should not privilege or romanticize one fear over the other. The 2020 pandemic provoked a severe and serious crisis for democracy around the world. And according to many uh, analysis, it has accentuated the decline of democracy observed in the last decade or so. Government got, uh, responded to the pandemic by engaging in abuses of power, silencing critiques and weak weakening or shattering important institutions, often undermining the very systems of accountability needed to protect public health. Authoritarian leaders grew bolder, for example, Orban or Modi, um, and many states observed a sharp decline in freedom from 2020 onward. Fear and states of emergency on a large scale enable to reverse the suspension of rights and to start habituating the population to it. Obedience is a matter of habituation, as are powers, the power of the leader in states of emergency. And so what my only point here is that this pandemic is the closest we're going to get to climate catastrophes because of its global reach. And so um, 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 what I wanted to say is that on the one hand, we have um, a, um, um, a, a, a kind of fear that points to a pol politics of vulnerability uh, and that points to the uh, relationship between populism and the politics of body vulnerability. That's my uh, first thing. And the second, my second point is that the pastoral fear that we all experienced during the corona pandemic is going to be very close uh, in its uh, formal uh, uh, handling and managing to the uh, climate crisis. And this, uh, as I suggest also, has led to a severe decline of democracy. And so my point is that bellicist or pastoral fears are both different paths to authority Thank you. Thank, thank you so, so much, Eva, um, for, again, another amazing uh, talk. So I am now honored for the last uh, talk to, to be uh, by uh, Kuan Jin Shin. He is currently the director of the Institute of Sociology, China Academy of Sci Social Science, and Vice President of, Chi of Chinese Sociological Association. He received his PhD from Chinese Academy of Social Science uh, in, in 1997, and his uh, research area focus on rural sociology, rural urban development, social certification, and social mobilization. Uh, his work include modern China uh, social structures, 
uh, modern uh, Chinese social mobilization, Chinese will of society and other books. Um, and his last co-edited book uh, was about uh, Chinese dream and the practice in uh, Zizhenyek society. Please join me in welcoming him for his talk, the present, the present situation, challenges, and the way ahead of social development and justice in China in post-COVID period. Uh, dear all colleagues, good afternoon, and thank you to the chairman of this session, Sarah. Uh, I'm very glad to take part in the World Congress of Social Art by ISA at this moment in this year, especially because it is the second time for the president of Chinese Association of Social Art to deliver a speech in the session, in this kind of session on behalf of the CAS, I mean the uh, Chinese Association of Sociology, and the Chinese sociologists. But on the other hand, it also because that uh, is very pitiful, Chinese Association of Sociology is not a member of ISA yet. And uh, originally, uh, Professor Li Ling, uh, the former vice president of Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, it was invited to do a speech in this session. But uh, the Bureau of International Cooperation of the CAS, I mean the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, said uh, now the President of the Chinese Association of Sociology is Chen Guanjin, not you. So now I'm here. And uh, before uh, I decided to take part in this session, uh, Tom uh, from Brazil gave me our topic uh, to prepare this uh, speech. It, it is uh, the present situation, challenges, and the way ahead of social development and justice in China in post-COVID period from a sociological perspective. So I think maybe it is a very good chance for me to introduce Chinese social economic development to you, to all of you, to all colleagues, from, <clears throat> from all the world. Of course, it's very simple. Since Professor Li Lin, as the Direct in General of the Institute of Sociology, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and the President of CES, <clears throat> to take part in the ISA Congress for the first time, it has been over 10 years. During this period, China has experienced a lot of great changes and development. And the world has also undergone tremendous changes. Uh, for example, the COVID pandemic. For China, the biggest change and development is that it has entered a new stage of development that is the stage of promoting the modernization characteristic of China. It could be said that the modernization process of China began from 1840. It was in that year that the opening work, a war, open, open war broke out, and the Western countries brought modern guns and cannons, cannons to China. While bringing profound disasters to China, it also brought modernization opportunities. More than 118 years have passed since then. During this period, many important historical events continued to occur. 
such as the Eight Nation Aliens invasion of China, the Hundred Days Reform, the Revolution of 1911, the World War II, like, and so on, which drew ancient China into a disastrous status for 100 years. And the Chinese people's life was very difficult, or extremely difficult, I think. After 1949, new China was established, and the China's modernization into a new historical period, especially since 1978, China's modernization development has been rapidly advancing for a long time and has made remarkable progress over the past 40 years. In 2010, Chinese GDP reached 6.09 trillion US dollars, ranking second in the world, equivalent to 40.5% of the US GDP of 15.05 trillion US dollars that year. In 2022, China achieved a GDP of 18 trillion US dollars, equivalent to 30.7% of the US GDP of, uh, no, of, uh, uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, it should be uh, 18 trillion US dollars during the same period. In 2022, China's per capita GDP reached uh, 12,700 uh, US dollars, reaching three hold levels set by the World Bank for the high income, in, uh, income countries. The urbanization rate of the national population has also increased from 17.8% from in 1978 to 65.2% in 2022. And in 2022, the consolidation rate of nine-year compulsory education will be 95%. 0.5% and the growth in enrollment ratio of senior high school will be 91.6% and the growth enrollment ratio of higher education will be 59.6%. Meanwhile, the per capita disposal income of urban and rural residents has also increased significantly. In 2022, the per capita the per capita disposal income of urban and rural households in China was uh, 49,283 49, yuan and uh, 20,133 20, yuan, respectively, and calculated at compara comparable prices, it increased by 18.9 times and 40 and 24.5 times compared to 1978 respectively. The living standards and the quality of urban and rural residents in China has also been continuously improving. The increase in coefficients of living consumption expenditure for urban and rural residents nationwide has decreased from 57.5% and 67.7% in 1978 to 29.5% and 33.33% 33 uh, 33 in 2022, respectively. Through these significant developments, China element, eliminated absolute poverty in rural areas in 2020. More importantly, with the continuous deep deepening of market-oriented reform, the development of the modern social security system is also very per, pro, prominent. By 2022, China, China's social security system has achieved full coverage with about 1 billion people insured by basic pension insurance 
and the over 1.36 billion people insured by basic medical insurance. This is the world's largest pension insurance and medical insurance system. As I mentioned earlier, China's economic and social development has entered a new stage of promoting Chinese pace, Chinese pace to modernization. The Chinese pace to modernization in the new stage should have five characteristics, namely the modernization of a huge population, the modernization of common prosperity of, for all people, the modernization of coordinated development of material civilization and the sp spiritual civilization, and the modernization of taking the pace of peaceful development. The Chinese pace to modernization should also follow the general role of the modernization development of human society. As of now, China needs to accelerate the implementation of new industrialization, new urbanization, information, informatization led by digitization and artificial intelligence and the construction of a unified national market economy system. In the field of social development, China has more problems that needed to be gradually solved. Pulling the net not a shield, it is necessary for China to promote the modernization of Chinese society and the synchronization of economic modernization as possible as quickly, with the aim of promoting social fairness and justice. Firstly, from the perspective of modern changes in the social structure, the development of the middle class or middle income group is crucial at present. present. <clears throat> According to the estimation of the National Bureau of Statistics of China, the size of the middle income group among Chinese residents with a total and annual household income of uh, 90,000 to, uh, to uh, 500,000 yuan is approximately uh, 400 million, account, accounting for the about 28.6% of the total population, far below the level at that a modern society should have for the middle income group. Secondly, from the perspective of social inequality, income inequality is a significant issue. The income gap between urban and rural residents in China has decreased relatively quickly, with the ratio of per capita disposable income of urban residents to the per capita disposable income of rural residents decreasing from 3.33 times in uh, 2009 to uh, 2.45 times in 2022. However, the Gini coefficient of national residents' income distribution declined very slowly. In 2008, the Gini coefficient reached its peak about 0 0.4499 and will decline to 0 0.466 by 2021. It can be said that it is very difficult to reduce the Gini coefficient in the last, okay, in the last uh, uh, 30 years, the Gini coefficient has only decreased by 0 0.033 percentage points in total, especially from 2014 to 2021. The Gini coefficient of national income of distribution has only decreased by 0 0.0. 0 0.003 percentage, which is almost ne negligible. The basic reason for the slow decline of the Gini coefficient nationwide is that the income inequalities within urban and rural areas themselves are still huge. According to the quantile calculation, in 2022, the average income of the 
highest 20% group of urban households is 6.32 times that of the lowest 20% group in rural areas, this ratio is 9.17 times. Thirdly, from the perspective of social undertakings, the problem of inequality also exists. In the fields of education among the students of so-called key universities, the proportion of students born in rural areas is not proportional to the proportion of rural population in the national total population. And the proportion of students from the low-income classes in urban areas is also not proportional to the proportion of the low-income classes in urban areas in the total urban population. In the field of social security, there is still a problem of fragmentation. Well, populations with different identities, for example, rural urban residents, urban residents not on job or on job like that, are placed on the different social insurance systems. And the coordination of social security between urban and rural areas is far from being achieved. In the field of medical and health care, not only are there still quite a serious problem of difficult and expensive medical treatment, but the problem of uneven urban, rural, and regional allocation of medical and health resources is also quite prominent. The de development of public health cannot keep up with actual needs, and the middle and the low income groups are more vulnerable to various public health risks and crises than other groups. For example, it is worth, it is worth noting that during the post-COVID-19, not the co post, in the COVID-19 period, the social economic development of China is confronted with a lot of challenges. Some very important challenges are taking place in the relationships between the demand and the supply of a labor market. The decreasing rate of demand is much bigger than that of supply. The increasing rate of income of rural and urban households is obviously slowing down, and the case is the same for the narrowing rate of income gaps between rural and urban residents. Different regions and different social classes, especially the incomes of low-income classes, decreased in the COVID pandemic pandemic period. The social governance at the level of a growth road society is faced with new challenges, especially in the COVID pandemic period. The quantity of labor dispute cases is increasing. Risks of social conflicts are increasing, and one key reason being the crisis of public health. To cope with these challenges and risks, and to improve the social development and justice, China should foster the social economic development with higher quality and as, as quickly as possible, especially implement the new strategies of rural development, urbanization, and the social economic integration of rural and urban areas, and to balance the social economic developments among different regions, make more efforts to realize the employment by origin strategy and related policies, to improve the relationship between the labor and the capital, and accelerate the recovery growth of income of rural and urban households, especially that of low-income classes, and set up a more just system of income distribution covering the market income, transfer, transfer income, and charitable undertakers in order to promote the common prosperity of all people, to develop the middle classes or middle income class, and the modernization of a social structure, and the quicken the development of modern social governors and the social organizations, well, say the NGOs, to improve social participation and so on. In the sense of modern sociology, Chinese sociology, okay, one minute, okay. Chinese sociology was imported from the 
with the, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the first half of the 20th century, especially in the decades before the Japanese troops invasion of China, Chinese sociology gradually developed, especially with the development of localization in the early 1950s. Due to various reasons, Chinese sociology was temporarily discontinued in 1979 with the initiation of, in, in, initiation of China's reform and opening up, Chinese sociology also began to recover and rebuild. In 1980, under the leadership of Professor Fei Xiaotong, China's first sociological research institution, the Institute of Sociology of the Case Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, was officially established. And in 1984, China's first sociology department was established in Nankai University. After more than 40 years of development now, there are around 50 sociological research institutions in national, provincial, and municipal academies, academies of social sciences, and 170 sociological colleges, colleges, and colleges, sorry, and departments in universities, and 300 colleges or, and departments of social work in universities and around um, 100,000 personnel are engaged in sociological teaching and research work. Since the restoration and the rest rebuilt, Chinese sociology has vigorously carried out a lot of researches on the social reality of China, especially in the social development. And on the other hand, Chinese sociology has continuously carried out a large amount of exchanges and Corporations with the sociological communities of various countries around the world. In the new area, Chinese sociology is willing to further strengthen exchanges and cooperation with sociologists around the world with a more open attitude, especially cooperation in these areas of social structure and change, social mobility and social inequality, urban and rural development, family and gender social mentality and the social values, social security and the social welfare, social work and the social charity, social organizations, social participation and the social governance, artificial intelligence and the digital society, consumption and the culture, environmental protection and the low carbon living. We all warmly welcome sociologists from around the world who are interested in China's China's economic and social development to visit China, searching for Chinese sociologists with common research topics and all interests to conduct in-depth academic exchange and cooperation. Thank you, sorry. Okay. Just, I think it's the first time to introduce Chinese sociology to yeah. sociologists from the world, all the world. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much, Quan uh, Xinxin. Uh, unfortunately, I look to the time and we are behind our schedule, so it will be no q and A. I'm really sorry for uh, for the four speakers, but uh, we uh, we need to go ahead uh, to very important uh, item in this uh, uh, in this events uh, also uh, is the installation of a new president. Ha, ha, ha.